This lecture gives an introduction to finite element model updating, covering several preliminaries and the big picture before we dive into some details on how the optimization is actually done. Here's an overview of the whole process, and uh, the things with check marks are things we've already talked about. Um, we start with some finite element model. We've learned how to create some simple models in NASTRAN. We learned how to reduce those to test analysis models, um, and then to pick accelerometer locations and prepare for a test. We haven't really learned anything about doing a test, but if you're interested in that, you can sign up for EMA 540 every fall. And we've talked a lot about the comparison, that once the test is done, how we will compare the finite element model to the modal test. And so the next steps are to understand um, how we actually update the model then, how we use that comparison to update the model and come up with an improved finite element model. So there are two types of uh, finite element updating methods, representational and knowledge-based. We'll talk about both of those in a minute. Um, we'll focus mostly on knowledge-based in this class. But basically, we have a finite element model, and there's some problems in the mass and stiffness matrices that cause it to not be accurate. So we want to figure out how we can make it accurate. But there are many, many different ways we could do that. Um, we could just fix the mass and stiffness matrices themselves, you know, just change some numbers in them, right? There are advantages and disadvantages to that. It's not very physical, right? Um, we could go to the element level mass and stiffness matrices. Those have a little more of a connection to reality. Um, you know, there, um, a beam element, for example, it has, you know, terms in it that represent the bending and the axial and torsional stiffness of a beam. And so we might be able to update those and then assemble. So usually we're thinking more about physical things, things we can have intuition for. So the material properties, the thicknesses, the lengths, um, places where things are connected, stiffnesses of joints. Those are the things we usually want to update. And those um, will be some of the hardest to update. So first of all, the representational model. The idea is, as I was hinting at before, that if we have some initial stiffness matrix, we want to find a change to it that can give us a stiffness matrix that brings the measurements in the FEM into, agree into agreement, or that brings the natural frequencies to agree with the test natural frequencies, or the cross orthogonality to be ideal. So um, usually methods that do this just consider solving for a matrix delta k, um, and there's usually no opportunity to connect that to parameters such as stiff um, thicknesses or modulus or different things. So, um, so that's a problem. Um, these representational methods are sometimes called direct methods. One of them that I've heard a fair amount is this uh, analytical model improvement algorithm, but there are others. Um, these methods typically don't require iteration. The nice thing about them is you can just solve a linear algebra problem or some other problem to get delta k. And you don't need um, iteration or optimization or to worry about whether the, the solution doesn't exist or there are multiple minima. So it can be um, very, very good. With these methods, you can also sometimes get a model that perfectly fits your test data. Uh, with the typical approach, the knowledge-based models, we might update all of the parameters that we think are in error. Very often we do, and we still can't quite get things to agree as well as we want to. So um, there are some advantages to these approaches. They are convenient and easier in a lot of ways, but there are some really big disadvantages. Um, the main one is that if we want to make design changes to the model, once we do this, um, any change that we make 
can completely invalidate the whole process. If we make design changes, because there's no physics base to the updates that we've done, there's no guarantee whatsoever that a design change will be accurate. Another big one is configurations. If we think about a launch vehicle, we need the model to be accurate on the ground. We need it to be accurate right at liftoff. We need to be accurate when the fuel tanks are half full, one third full. We need to be accurate after we separate the structure and make it into different types of structures. So our model needs to work in all of those configurations. And that's not likely to happen if we're using this approach. The other problem is it doesn't give us any insight into what we did wrong and tell us what we could do differently next time. So there are some good things about these approaches, but because of uh, these uh, big disadvantages, they're usually not used in practice, in aerospace at least. I was thinking about it, and I, there is one possible application where you might see these used, and I have seen people at least explore using them. And that's the case where, um, say we're building an assembly. For example, this is um, a large diesel generator built by Kohler Company. And they might, uh, these might be installed in hospitals as backup systems for power, or even on like yachts as power systems, a way to power the yacht when the, um, when the motor is not running, or different things like that. But anyway, um, there's a big diesel engine, and then there's an electric generator. And if you're the Kohler company, there's a good chance that you buy this engine from someone else, uh, that you buy it, you tell them what you want, it shows up, and you design everything else, the skid, the generator, which also may be bought or may be designed in-house. And you need to know that this whole system won't have any resonances. But, um, you know, chances are the supplier who sells you the engine is not really willing to give you detailed CAD models. If they are, um, it, it's going to be a real pain to mesh something like that, and there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And so you'd spend a lot of effort trying to come up with a finite element model for that part. And when in the end, you have no ability to change it um, it just comes and is how it is, and you bolt it on. So all that finite element work is uh, very possibly not really worth it. So um, what you can think about doing instead is uh, do all of your modeling on this part and on the skid, but um, after the engine comes in, do a test on it, collect the measurements, and then um, and then use that to come up with your, uh, with a model that works just for this component. And if you can get a model that matches this component and that is still accurate when you bolt this component to the assembly, then this approach could be really good. So again, I don't know a lot of people that use this approach, but I think this is definitely one viable approach for direct methods. So most model updating that we do is knowledge-based. And um, so we have to um, figure out what parameters in our model might be wrong, or figure out how to parameterize the things that we're not sure about. If we guess incorrectly, or if we don't pick a parameter, or if there's something else wrong with our model that just can't be fixed by changing a number, then we'll probably fail. And we, Often, you know, this is what happens. We go in circles and try to figure out where the parameters are that we haven't included that still need to be updated. The good thing, though, is that any changes we make will um, have meaning. They'll often uncover problems we made during modeling. In an ideal case, um, in an ideal case, we come to know the model more and more. We get more and more confidence that what we've done is correct. Um, but the downside is that we won't ever, usually won't ever have perfect agreement, and often there's a real struggle getting things to agree. On the one hand, um, this is a feature as well, these one-step representational methods. Even though they can find a delta k that might exactly match all of the natural frequencies perfectly, 
those natural frequencies from the test have a little bit of errors in them anyway. So it might not be wise to match everything perfectly. Maybe it is better to rely on a model and try to bring that model as close as we can to measurements. All right, um, a couple questions for you to think about now. Suppose we get perfect correlation between our model and test. Does that guarantee that um, all of the parameters that we use to get that correlation are perfect? Um, another question we might ask is, can we, if we just had test results, could we completely identify a physical model? That's kind of an analog quest, uh, uh, corresponding question. The answer to those questions is no on both cases. Um, and I'll use this simple example to illustrate it. Suppose we just have statics. We throw out all the fun dynamics, and we just have kx equals f. We could do a static test where we would apply um, a unit force. So we're dealing with K inverse, or a matrix we'll call G, the flexibility matrix. So suppose we apply a unit force, and we measure how the whole structure deforms. So if we do that, what that's going to do is we're putting a unit force in at some degree of freedom. So basically, when we do this multiplication, it's just going to pull out the ith column of the flexibility matrix. And uh, we could do this point by point and measure the whole flexibility matrix. And this approach can work really well. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that if we tried to do this for stiffness, it becomes really difficult. Um, one reason for that is that the flexibility matrix is the inverse of K. So we talked earlier about the fact that the expansion, uh, this matrix can be extended in the modes, and it has a term that goes 1 over the natural frequency squared. So as the natural frequencies go up, the terms become less and less important, and we can capture a lot of the flexibility in just the first few modes. In contrast, the stiffness matrix, if we expand it, um, it has the natural frequencies in the numerator. And and as a result, that um, it's very slow to converge. And so it's very difficult to actually measure the stiffness matrix, even though we do measure um, the flexibility. We can measure the flexibility or components of the flexibility matrix. So in static model updating, this is often used. We'll measure components of the flexibility matrix and use that as a tool in model updating. But consider now that if we have many degrees of freedom, we, we'll, we can't apply enough forces to completely identify the matrix. For a typical problem, you know, our test article has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We're going to model that with, you know, somewhere between tens of thousands and millions of degrees of freedom in a finite element model. And we have a couple hundred sensors and you know, capturing, you know, maybe 50 or 100 modes. So, you know, we have 50 or 100 unique pieces of information, plus the mode shapes, which, you know, are typically a little less reliable, but um, in terms of detail. So even though we have, say, 500 sensors by, um, by 50 modes, we don't really have, you know, 500 times 50 unique quantities that we can use. You know, the number of quantities that we really have are much smaller. Like maybe the natural frequencies and all the terms in a cross orthogonality matrix. That's typically all that we really will trust. So if we want to have any hope of getting this right, we have to try to start with a problem that's solvable by trying to get the best finite element model we can get from the get-go. Um, so one thing that's harped on again and again is matching the drawings. Our model should, uh, should match the drawings, and, and anything that we've approximated, we should take care that we are confident that those are as reasonable as possible approximations as we can make. And then when we do finite element updating, we'll try to make the smallest change in the parameters that we can. 
and that way we stay near this model that we're pretty confident in. If we have to make a big change, we'll usually argue about that and think about that and really try to make sure that it's justified before we just go ahead with it. All right, so we'll need to know a few uh, basic definitions and things to understand uh, what we're going to do with optimization. So um, we'll use y uh, for the state variables. And these could be all kinds of things, natural frequencies or the most common and typical. We could also use um, the mode shapes, so that's less often done. Though metrics like the cross orthogonality in the MAC are very common optimization state variables. So these are variables, we've measured them and we're trying to drive them to some value. We're trying to do that by changing design variables like the thickness modulus, you know, all of these parameters in the model. So we usually um, assume that the state variables are some unknown function of the design variables. And so if we start with some nominal values for the design variables, the finite element model gives us this f that lets us compute the nominal, say, natural frequencies. We can then compare the natural frequencies with the measured ones, and we can try to find an update to the alphas that will make them, um, that will drive the model into agreement, that will make the measured natural frequencies perfectly match the nominal, or the finite element model natural frequencies y. So uh, we usually use a Taylor series because f is unknown. So we might expand it in a Taylor series about the nominal point. So this would be, this right here would be y0. This is the finite element model evaluated at its nominal point. Then we have a derivative or a Jacobian matrix for a multi-degree or multi-variable case times the changes that we're going to make to a, a correction that will add to alpha 0 that will bring the model into agreement. So with this, we can solve for the correction delta alpha that brings our model into agreement. And let me um, show you that. So um, again, we're looking for alpha, a, a correction delta alpha that when added to our nominal will give us the parameters that bring this model into agreement. And notice in general, we can't just go measure the, we can't just go measure alpha to know what it should be. Um, it's just, it's not known. We don't know um, if we knew the thickness better, if we knew the material properties better, we wouldn't be doing model updating. But typically, even after our, doing our best to estimate the nominal, al the mo nominal parameters, thickness, modulus, we still need to do some kind of correction. Okay, so um, let's take the example of a cantilever beam. And uh, we want, to, we want a, um, our state variable to be the first natural frequency, which in this case we can actually look up for a cantilever beam what that natural frequency is. And here it is given in terms of the Young's modulus, the area moment of inertia I, the air, cross-sectional area A, the density, the length, and then there's a constant here that changes with mode number, but this is the value for mode 1. So we could go look that up in a book, and we have f. And so notice if our, um, if our design variable is the thickness, we can actually um, plug that in. And, um, oops, I noticed there's a little bit of a typo here. Anyway, we can plug that in, and um, we can explicitly write this function. y is equal to a function. The first natural frequency is a function of the thickness in this way. And actually, in this case, we can factor out the h. also need another b right there. We can factor out the h, and y is just some constant times the thickness. So if we knew what the natural frequency should be, we could directly solve for uh, the thickness that makes that happen. 
So um, this is the easiest updating problem that we could do, and it uh, would be pretty easy, pretty straightforward, right, to solve that problem. In a more general case, though, we have many different natural frequencies that we're trying to match. And, um, and then we might also have, you know, the cross orthogonality, which is um, a function of, you know, between two modes, and we might have another term for the cross orthogonality between a different pair of modes, and so on and so on. So we might have a lot of uh, states that we're trying to match. So um, in the most general case, what we'll do is we will expand this in a Taylor series about the nominal model. And so we will, um, let's make this a little bigger actually. So um, if we do that, we get um, the nominal model and then the Jacobian with respect to the parameters. In this case, they have a vector of parameters, so this will actually be a matrix. And, um, and this could be a vector of parameters. And usually we neglect any quadratic or higher order terms. So, um, so this term right here is y0, that's the nominal state values. So if we set um, if we set y equal to the measured natural frequencies, for example, then um, we can move this term to the other side. We get y minus y0. And then we um, can invert the Jacobian, which is a matrix in the most general case, and solve for the changes in the parameters that we might need. So that's a, a common um, approach. Typically, f is not known analytically, right? Um, f of alpha is something we get from um, by doing a modal solve in the finite element software. And so we, you know, we can't express that as a function. So um, what we might do is instead calculate the Jacobian using a finite difference. Or in other words, we evaluate the FEM in, uh, for the nominal model. We evaluate the FEM for the nominal model plus some perturbation in whatever parameters we think uh, might be important. And if we divide that by the perturbation in the parameter, we get um, an estimate of one column of the Jacobian. So this would be just one column. And we could repeat that for any any set of parameters until we had all of the until we had the full Jacobian matrix. So in a scalar case, f is just a function, like we had above, a linear function. Um, and it's a function of the design variable. And um, let's say that this blue curve that you see right here is the um, is f that that's the um, blow this up a little that blue curve is the um, true f of alpha Okay, so that's the true function. Um, but we don't know that. So what we can do is we can use the finite element model to evaluate that function at two points. We get f of alpha plus delta, f of alpha. So for some step in the parameter of alpha, of delta. And then um, we can use those to compute the slope, and basically the derivative, or the Jacobian, is a slope at that point, um, at this point that we've taken a step about. Um, my drawing is not very good there. This line should actually go through. Um, oops, yeah, it won't let me do that. That line should actually um, go through the this point here. But anyway, so that's a derivative. 
It's worth noting, though, that um, we don't have to calculate a derivative. If we wanted, we could actually take a really big step. So in this second example, um, in this second example, let's suppose that, um, let's suppose we took delta being a large value. Okay, so suppose we took delta to be a large value. In that case, um, we could have a, what we would be fitting would be more of a secant. And if there was a curvature here, we're just getting the average slope over a range. That could be useful if this function was either noisy or if it, um, you know, there were some local um, singularities or or problems that would cause that to not be um, accurate, and cause a derivative to be inaccurate. Okay, so that's the idea behind a Jacobian. Um, in our previous example, the Jacobian um, is just, um, would be given by this. Uh, if we take the derivative with respect to h, we would just get this term right here. And we would usually evaluate that at the nominal. So our Jacobian depends on what value of the other system parameters we use to evaluate it at. Um, let's look at a two, uh, two by two case, because that will be a little more informative and representative of what we're doing. Um, so suppose we have parameters h and l. We have two parameters we want to, um, we want to solve for. And suppose we have two um, frequencies that we've measured, the first natural frequency and the second. So this 1.875, we'll just call that 1.9 here to make things simpler. And the next one is roughly 4, we'll just say. So that's our model. Our model says that the natural frequencies, the first one is this number times this quantity, the second number one is this number times the same quantity. So we have f of alpha for mode 1 and mode 2. So we could now compute the Jacobian, and it would be 2 by 2 in this case. And um, we want what we want is this Jacobian to multiply delta alpha, so our two parameters, the changes to those two parameters. So that would look like this over here, where this is df d alpha. Um, this matrix multiplies a change in parameter 1, a change in parameter 2. And, um, and if we add up each of the columns times their respective delta alphas, because you see how the denominator here has delt the derivative of alpha or delta alpha, alpha as well. So if we multiply delta alpha times these derivatives, we get the change in the frequency. So that's, if we multiply that, what we get is delta f1, delta f2. Okay, so if we do all of that math, um, we find that um, this first column is actually proportional to the second column because the only thing the derivative changes is this little constant here. We do get a different constant in the two columns, a different scaling, but the, um, but the derivative, um, but it, it doesn't change these constants. <coughs> Those constants depend only on the on the mode shapes, or on the boundary conditions, and the geometry and things in the problem. So if our system is known to be a cantilever beam, and, um, and those boundary conditions are accurate, um, this uh, Jacobian is rank 1, and basically that tells us that we can match the natural frequencies either matching the first mode only or the second mode only, um, and we can trade off between delta H and delta L in various ways, but we can't uniquely determine both H and L from mode 1 and mode 2. 
those are two independent uh, uh, the way the system works out the Jacobian shows us that we just can't solve that problem so this is a good example of a case where um, we formulated a problem that wasn't solvable we had a goal um, and we used a, we created a finite element model where we said that we'll vary h and l will vary the length of the beam and will vary its thickness but in the end what we found is that those two parameters have basically the same effect on natural frequency one and natural frequency two and so no amount of updating can resolve that problem we um, we can choose values of H and values of L, uh, various different ones that will satisfy things, but that's all that we can do. So, um, so that concludes that example. Um, on our next lecture, we'll start into modal parameter sensitivities, and we will look at how we deal with those.